Africa. This ancient continent, filled with intrigue and mystery, rarely gives up its secrets to the outside world. For generations, the so-called Dark Continent has inspired countless books and movies that have fired the imaginations of armchair adventurers everywhere. Throughout history, missionaries and explorers who have braved the interior of this vast continent have brought back compelling and fantastic tales of the monstrous creatures that roam the interior of the seemingly endless forests and swamps of the Congo Basin. Monsters, in fact, that could well be living dinosaurs. But the critics claim that all the dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago after a massive asteroid struck the Earth, causing a catastrophic planet-wide extinction. Therefore, no human being has ever seen a living dinosaur. But is this really the case? Ancient historical documents and many archaeological discoveries over the past 200 years tell a strikingly different story. Pliny the Elder, a first century Roman historian who was widely traveled first as a soldier in the Roman army, and later as a lawyer and procurator, wrote the following. India produces the largest elephants, as well as the largest dragons, which are perpetually at war with one another. And on African dragons, he wrote, When the dragon is drawn from its hole into the air, it stirs up the air and makes it shine. Dragons are found in Ethiopia and India. The ancient Egyptians also knew the giant long-necked behemoths that lived in the marshes of the Nile River. Here we see the Narmer palette, dated from the time of King Narmer of 3100 BC, who united the separate territories of South and North Egypt in a single unified kingdom. Although the animals are somewhat stylized, their long necks, coupled with the attempt of two animal keepers to restrain them, are very reminiscent of the long-necked sauropod dinosaurs of the past. Among the many fascinating archaeological finds from ancient Mesopotamia, which is now modern-day Iraq, comes this ancient cylinder seal dated at around 3300 BC and is likewise decorated with animals that look remarkably like dinosaurs, confirming that these giant plant eaters might have indeed survived until fairly recent times and were well known to the inhabitants of North Africa and the Middle East in biblical times. Here is a comparison between these dinosaur-like animals and the fossil skull of the Diplodocus. The likeness is quite remarkable. Furthermore, the animals are depicted as carrying their tails high off the ground, which is exactly how long-necked, long-tailed or sauropod dinosaurs once walked. The Nile is over 4,100 miles long and starting from Lake Victoria, it cuts its way through the Congo, Ethiopia, Sudan, Uganda, Burundi, Tanzania, Kenya, Egypt, and finally empties into the Mediterranean Sea. It supplies 11 different African countries with water, 
and is considered to be the longest river in the world. The Nile is up to 36 feet deep and is a perfect waterway for large dinosaur-like animals to migrate south into the much more remote Congo Basin region and well away from the growing human population of North Africa. The Dogon tribe of the Mali region produced this dinosaur-like figurine depicting a tribesman riding a large reptilian creature, which we can compare here to a duck-billed dinosaur, and an interesting resemblance too. Likewise, this small gold figurine was produced in the 18th century by the Ashanti tribe of the Gold Coast, now known as Ghana. Although many other figurines were of animals that were easily recognized by anthropologists, this animal remains a mystery. Could it, too, be the image of a dinosaur that was known to the people of that area? These three examples of early cave art from southern Africa not that far from the Congo Basin, are said to be at least 29,000 years old. Although they depict long-necked, four-legged animals with spikes or frills on their necks and backs, they have been labelled as mythical animals or stylized giraffes by anthropologists. But this beautiful and ancient depiction of a giraffe from the same period dismisses this theory. Could these animals too be images of dinosaurs that were familiar to the ancient inhabitants of southern Africa who lived on the fringes of the Congo Basin. One of the early accounts of the flora and fauna of western central Africa came from missionaries and explorers. In 1776, the Abbe Levian Bonaventure Proyart wrote in the history of the Loango, Kakongo, and other kingdoms in Africa about a group of Jesuit missionaries who had found the tracks of an enormous unknown animal in the jungle. Pinkerton's translation, published in 1914, reads thus, It must be monstrous. The prints of its claws are seen upon the earth and formed an impression on it of about three feet in circumference. In observing the posture and disposition of the footprints, they concluded that it did not run this part of the way, and that it carried its claws at a distance of seven or eight feet, one from the other. Prints this large could only have been made by an animal the size of an elephant, but elephants do not possess clawed toes. The identity of the monster remained a mystery until other reports eventually began to reach the outside world. Englishman Alfred Aloysius Smith, otherwise known as Trader Horn, was an ivory trader who worked alongside the river systems of Gabon and Cameroon in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In his later years, Smith worked in South Africa as a door-to-door -door peddler of pots and pans. One of his customers, the novelist Ethelreda Lewis became fascinated by the many stories of Smith's adventures and wrote his biography in the book Trader Horn, the Ivory Coast in the Earlies, published in 1927. The book was considered quite racy at the time and detailed his adventures in jungles teeming with buffalo, gorillas, man-eating leopards, serpents and headhunters. However, on page 257, Smith included the following intriguing information about a river monster much feared by the natives. Aye, and behind the Cameroons there's things livin' we know nothing about. I could have made books about many things. The Jagonini, they say, is still in the swamps and rivers. Giant diver, it means. Comes out of the water and devours people. Old men'll tell you what their grandfather saw, but they still believe it's there. 
Same as the Amali I've always taken it to be. I've seen the Amali's footprint, about the size of a good frying pan in circumference, and three claws instead of five. On February 13, 1910, the magazine supplement of the New York Herald asked the rhetorical question, Is a Brontosaurus roaming Africa's wilds? Later that year, Sir Clement Lloyd Hill, president of the African Society, was enjoying a view of Homer Mountain from a steam launch as it chugged its way across Lake Victoria from Kisumu to the capital Entebbe in Uganda. Suddenly, a huge, long-necked beast emerged from the lake and attempted to seize a native sitting on the bow of the launch. Fortunately, the man managed to fend off the monster, which vanished back into the depths of the lake. Also, in 1910, German naturalist and owner of the Hamburg Zoo, Karl Hagenbeck, recounted two different accounts from animal collector Hans Schomburg and Joseph Menges, a naturalist, concerning a monster that was described as half-elephant, half-dragon that lived in the Congo swamps. Menges believed that the animal was some kind of dinosaur, akin to the Brontosaurus, and lived primarily in the deep swamps. Hagenbeck sent an expedition to the Congo to search for the monster, but malaria and attacks by hostile natives got the better of them, and the expedition was eventually abandoned. Schomburg also informed Hagenbeck that hippos were absent from Lake Banguello in northern Rhodesia. The natives said this was because of the fearful long-necked monster that still inhabited the lake. In his book Beasts and Men, published in 1912, Hagenbeck wrote the following. On the walls of certain caverns in Central Africa, there are to be found actual drawings of this strange creature. From what I have heard of the animal, it seemed to me that it can only be some kind of dinosaur, seemingly akin to the Brontosaurus. As the stories come from so many different sources and all tend to substantiate each other, I'm almost convinced that some such reptile must still be in existence. In 1912, the novelist Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who created the character Sherlock Holmes, wrote the novel The Lost World, about a group of explorers who discover a population of living dinosaurs on a remote plateau mountain in the Amazon. Tales of living dinosaurs in Africa, coupled with Conan Doyle's novel, caught the attention of Hollywood, which released the 1925 silent classic of the same name, starring Wallace Beery. The movie was a hit and has been remade several times since. In 1913, the German government decided to survey its then colony of Cameroon and chose Captain Ludwig Freiherr von Stein zu Lauschnitz to lead the expedition. Von Stein included the following fascinating report on a creature very much feared by the Negroes of certain parts of the territory of the Congo, the Lower Ubangi, the Sangha and the Ikalemba rivers. They called the animal Mokeli Mbembe. The animal is said to be of a brownish-gray color, its size approximating that of an elephant. It is said to have a long and very flexible neck. Some spoke of a long muscular tail like that of an alligator. Canoes coming near it are said to be doomed. The animals are said to attack the vessels at once and to kill the crews but without eating the bodies. The creature is said to live in the caves that have been washed out by the river in the clay of its shores at sharp ends. 
It is said to climb the shore even in daytime in search of its food. Its diet is said to be entirely vegetable. In 1932, Scottish explorer Ivan Sanderson and American naturalist Gerald Russell were on an animal collecting expedition in northern Cameroon. As they were exploring a place called the Mamfe Pool on the Manu River, they found the steep cliff like riverbanks had several caves, some of which were partially submerged. The explorers were startled by a loud disturbance, like animals fighting one another. Followed by an ear splitting roar of some monster hidden in one of the caves. Sanderson also briefly glimpsed the back of something larger than a hippopotamus breaking the surface, before quickly submerging into the murky river. Upstream, near the confluence of the Cross River, They came upon what they described as vast hippo like tracks. Although there were no hippopotamus in the area, Sanderson was informed by the local natives that this creature called the Mbulu Mbembe drove the hippos away. The public's fascination with such reports prompted Hollywood to make another sensational movie titled King Kong in 1933, starring Fay Ray as the damsel in distress. In 1937, Discovery magazine ran an article by Captain William Hitchens, a former intelligence officer and a colonial magistrate who spent most of his career in Africa. The article was entitled African Mystery Beasts. In a section on colossal lizards, he wrote the following Other accounts speak of a gigantic lizard with a neck like a giraffe, legs like an elephant's, and a small snake like head. And a tail thirty feet long. Several white hunters have asserted that they have tracked what must have been such beasts, and the Smithsonian Institution, some years ago, sent an expedition to locate this animal. But the project, unfortunately, met with disaster and never arrived in the field of search. Eleven years later, in 1948, A. S. Array, a Cameroonian national, Was swimming in Lake Barombi and b o l in northern Cameroon while keeping some visiting British soldiers company. Without warning, the water at the center of the lake began to stir, as if being disturbed from below. After everyone had hastily exited the water, two strange long necked creatures broke the surface. The first animal to appear had a long neck about 12 to 15 feet in length. Ending in a small, slender head that sported a spike of some kind at the top. A second, slightly smaller, long necked animal also surfaced, but without a spike or horn. The locals later claimed that the hornless animal was a female. As Are later recalled, some of the soldiers fled the scene, but others stayed and kept the two strange animals under observation. The animals reminded their observers of dinosaurs in appearance, with clearly visible scales covering the length of their necks. Both animals sank back under the water after a few minutes. Here is a drawing, including a description of the two animals made later by Array. He also later learned that the locals called these animals Jagonini, meaning giant diver, exactly as reported by Trader Horn in his book. In 1927. The locals further stated that the animals rarely left the water and were seen infrequently, which ties in favorably with the Mokeli and Bembi, as reported by von Stein during his exploration on the Cameroon Congo border in 1914. Also, in January 1948, the Saturday Evening Post. Knowing the public's fascination concerning possible living dinosaurs, published an article titled There Could Be Dinosaurs, written by Ivan T. Sanderson, who recounted his own experience in Cameroon 16 years before in 1932. In May 1954, six years after the Cameroon incident, Englishman Alan Brignall was working in Couture, northern Rhodesia. 
now Zambia. He and a colleague decided to go fishing in Lake Bangwalu. Brignall was fishing on the shore of the lake near two small reed-bound islands about 25 yards offshore. Suddenly, he was shocked by the appearance of a large animal that had abruptly surfaced near the islands. The Englishman noted that the creature was at least as big as a hippo, with a long vertical neck, a small head, with a clearly visible brow, blunt nose, jawline, and a humped back. The skin was described as smooth and uniformly grey all over. As Brignall watched, the creature swiveled its head from side to side, as if looking for something in the reeds. Brignall estimated that it held its head about four and a half feet out of the water, and that its neck was roughly twelve inches in diameter. While he tried to reach for his camera and alert his colleagues nearby, Brignall's movement startled the creature, and it sank vertically into the lake, and was not seen again. He was absolutely certain the animal he observed was not a snake, lizard, hippo, or crocodile. The local members of the Njumbo tribe later informed him that he observed the Imbalintu, a long-necked, bulbous-bodied aquatic monster that had chased all the hippos away. Reports of these animals, known by different names by the various tribes across western Central Africa, all speak of the same kind of animal that does not match the description of anything we know of living today and this only serves to deepen the mystery. Throughout the 1950s and 1960s, more low-budget but entertaining living dinosaur movies were released. Here is a short sample of some of them. In 1947, the bird expedition to the South Pole reported a warm water oasis deep inside the icy Antarctic. This is the story of another expedition and of what might be found, what might happen today in that remote, unexplored last frontier on Earth, unchanged since prehistoric times, the land unknown. Could man have survived in the dinosaur age of mighty monsters? Shudder at history's most ferocious killer, Tyrannosaurus Rex. The battle of the great Stegosauri. Huge carnivorous man-eating plants. The incredible water monster, Elasmosaurus. We'll never get out of here, Alan. Never, never, Stop never. Stop it, do you hear me? Stop it. This doesn't sound like you. We're not licked yet. That's how I rule. Where's the wreck? Talk. You're gonna rot here. witnessing a biological chain reaction, a geometrical progression of deadly menace. Look there, two points off the port bow.
We must find a way of destroying this creature in one piece. Judging by the beast's size, I would say it was powerful enough to drive a battleship. Of course, its tremendous electric charge is what projects the radiation. That's what makes the creature so deadly. Well, have you any concrete suggestions? Yes. First, block off the Thames. eruption a hundred million years ago. The land where monsters lived. Yes, you're heading out of this world. By jet airliner, by hydroplane, by helicopter, into the wildest of all jungles into the forbidding headwaters of the Amazon with Michael Rennie, Jill St. John, David Hedison, Claude Rains, Fernando Lamas, and Frosty the Poodle as they discover a primitive world exactly the way it was at the dawn of time in the most fantastic of adventure stories. For me, this story started three years ago when Burton White came to me. He told me of how in some Indian village out here in the jungle, He'd met a fever-stricken white man who babbled on about a plateau with monsters and diamonds. Here is the most amazing of all possible worlds. Oh! Oh! Daddy! You'll see man-eating vines that lure their prey. Spiders as tall as trees. Oh! Hair-raising attack by prehistoric monsters. Battle of the Titans to the death. The most terrible creatures of destruction that ever walked the earth. You'll flee through grotesque underground mazes from cannibals who demand human sacrifice. Sacrifice? The place they undoubtedly plan to kill you. No, not me, please, no. You'll be among the first mortals to cross the graveyard of the damned. You'll scale the incredible wall of death. You'll face the terrors of the Cave of Fire with its lake of molten lava, its fabulous pyramid of diamonds. And you'll be stunned by the horrifying 100-foot fire monster that guards a king's ransom in treasure. Get aboard! 
But strange reptiles are not only confined to the Congo. In the summer of 1961, Canadian missionaries Cal and Mary Bombay were driving through the Rift Valley in Kenya when their path was blocked by a large, strange-looking lizard. The animal was about nine feet long, possessed a series of spikes running the length of its back and tail, and had a head like a snake. The creature lay on the road for a good 20 minutes and even turned its head to look at the bemused missionaries. Its tongue flicked in and out of its mouth like a snake. Eventually, the reptile plodded off into the bush, allowing the Bombays to continue on their journey to the capital city, Nairobi. Later, Cal Bombay spoke with a zoologist in Canada to try and identify the strange reptile that he and his wife had encountered in Kenya. The zoologist refused to believe that the couple had seen a reptile such as the one they described, insisting that it had become extinct millions of years ago. Another mystery in Kenya and Tanzania concerns a flying reptile that bears a striking resemblance to a living pterosaur. Known as the Kongamatu, which means overwhelmer of boats, these aggressive creatures are nocturnal and are attracted by strong smells. Local fishermen are sometimes attacked by these aggressive flying creatures, which snatch up their catch of fish. The people explain that they have to bury their dead deeply enough to stop the Kongomato from attempting to dig up the decomposing bodies in order to consume the decaying flesh of the deceased. Remarkably, reports of an almost identical flying reptile is also known by the tribes people of Papua New Guinea, over 7,300 miles away from Kenya. The people of Papua New Guinea call this flying creature the Duas, which means demon flyer, and it exhibits a bioluminescent glow as it flies around the jungle mountains at night, sometimes attacking local fishermen to steal their catch. This intriguing wooden statuette is owned by the Rosminian Missionary Fathers, who are based in County Tipperary in Ireland. The small statuette bears a strong resemblance to a sauropod dinosaur, and was brought back by the brothers in 1965, after serving on the mission field in the Congo. Might this carving have been made 
by a craftsman who had seen one of these animals for himself in some remote location in the Congo? In 1971, missionary Joe Ellis was heading north to a village on the Motaba River in the northern Congo Republic to teach a Bible class when he suddenly caught sight of a huge animal moving slowly across a river ahead of him. The sight of the animal so startled Ellis that he screamed in shock and immediately shut off his outboard engine. Two thoughts raced through Ellis's mind. It's got a ridged back like a saw, and it's longer than his boat, which was thirty feet in length. Ellis sat silently and watched as the prehistoric-looking monster moved purposely across a river before heading into the jungle. Ellis never saw the head or tail of the animal, but its visible length was at least thirty feet. After recovering from the initial shock of seeing such a monster, Ellis reached his destination safely and warned the people of the village, Be careful, there's a monster out there. He received an even bigger shock when the people shrugged their shoulders and went about their daily business. He may as well have been talking about the weather. Later, Ellis discovered that the animal he saw was known as the Nguma Moneni, which is Lingala for Animal of the River, and is described as a giant snake-like lizard with a spiked frill that runs the length of its entire body and can reach a length of well over 80 feet. Not much else was heard of African water monsters until 1976 when herptologist James Powell from Lubbock, Texas traveled to Gabon to study rainforest crocodiles. Powell picked up stories from the Fang people about an enormous river monster called Nyamala and a local witch doctor by the name of Michael Obang picked out a picture of the Diplodocus from a book on dinosaurs as being a dead ringer from the Nyamala, which he saw exit a jungle pool 30 years before, in 1946. Obang stated that the Nyamala was well known to the local fishermen, who avoided the deep swamp pools dotted along the Ogui River, as it would kill hippos and sometimes attack canoes. Powell later conveyed this information to Dr. Roy P. Mackall, a biologist from the University of Chicago and vice president of the International Society of Cryptozoology, a group of like-minded academics who came together to conduct scientific research into unknown and mysterious animals worldwide. Mackall believed that the Nyamala was most likely the same as the Amali, reported by Trader Horn in the 1920s. In 1979, Mackall and Powell traveled to the People's Republic of the Congo to investigate suspected living dinosaurs. Mackall believed that the most promising search area would be the Likawala region, a huge and largely unexplored area of seasonally inundated swamp located between the Sanga and the Ubangi rivers in the northern part of the Congo. Upon arriving in the northern Congolese town of Imfondu, Mackall met with missionary Eugene Thomas and his wife Sandy, who had served in the area since 1955. Thomas agreed to act as a translator for Mackall and sent out for eyewitnesses. Mackall picked up a number of reports concerning an animal known as Mokeli Mbembe, not Nyamala, which is Lingala for one who stops the flow of rivers, and found that both the name and description of this animal matched the same information that von Stein had gathered in 1913. The animal was described as being between the size of a hippo and an elephant, with a bulbous body, a long, thin neck, a small snake-like head, and a long, flexible tail. The animal also possessed four stubby legs and was reddish-brown in color. Sometimes the animals would sport a rooster-like frill on top of its head, which indicated sexual dimorphism within the species. It lived in the rivers and swamps, ate vegetable material, 
and, like the Nyamala of Gabon, would sometimes attack canoes that approached it. Furthermore, those eyewitnesses who had seen Mokele and Bembi firsthand unfailingly picked out a picture of a sauropod dinosaur like this one from Macaul's book on prehistoric animals. Time ran out for Macaul and Powell, and they headed back to the U.S., tantalized by the reports. Macaul returned to the Congo in 1981 with a larger team, and this time headed south on the Likwala or Serb River. Macaul was motivated by an intriguing story told by two elderly pygmy men who had witnessed the killing of a Mokele and Bembi over twenty years before at Lake Telly, a remote body of water three miles wide and thirteen feet deep, situated almost in the heart of the Likawala swamps. Speaking through Jean Thomas, the two men recall how at least two Mokele and Bembis made a habit of entering the lake daily by using a water channel that merged with the swamps to the west, disturbing the fishing activities of the pygmies. In spite of their great fear of these animals, the Bangombi pygmies erected a stake barrier across the entrance to the lake. Later, when a Mokele and Bembi tried to break through the barrier, the pygmies speared it to death, then cut up the animal for meat, which took several days due to its size and length. However, those who ate the meat of the animal died shortly afterwards, which may have been due to food poisoning or simply natural causes. The forest-dwelling pygmies lived to an average of about 25 to 30 years of age. Few make it beyond 35. Although Macaul attempted to reach Lake Telly through a couple of narrow water channels that led to the lake from the unexplored Bai River, he discovered that the way was jammed with fallen trees making passage impossible with heavy dugout canoes. Also in 1981, Herman Regustas, a jet propulsion engineer from Pasadena, California, led his own expedition to the Congo and actually managed to reach Lake Telly by walking over land. Regustus found that the extreme humidity of the lake rendered his cameras inoperative, but he did manage to take a few snaps. Is this the submerging back of a Mokele and Bembe? Towards the end of their expedition, the Regustus team heard the ear-splitting roar of a huge animal as it crashed through the swamps near their camp one night, terrifying their native guides. Here, we can compare the sound of the mystery animal to the known animals of the same region. Encouraged by Roy Mackall's scientific approach to Mokele and Bembi, the usually conservative BBC Wildlife magazine featured an artist's impression of the monster on the cover of the December 1984 edition and included a seven-page article with photographs of the expedition. As the Mokele and Bembi craze continued into the 1980s, Disney released a movie based on Roy Mackall's expeditions called Baby, Secret of the Lost Legend. The movie starred Patrick McGowan, William Catt and Sean Young as scientists who discovered a family of living brontosauri in the Congo jungle. Sometimes, and only sometimes, all I wanted to do was find my very own dinosaur. A unique event happens. Looks like a brontosaurus. When history catches up with us. 
a desperate last attempt by mankind to save the last of the dinosaurs. Sean Young. Not everybody gets to experience this. William Cat. Baby, the secret of the lost legend. In 1987, Jim Culberson, a graduate in marine biology from the Florida Institute of Technology, also went in search of Mokeli and Bembi. Here is his interview with CNN. They were and they have inspired books and films and countless folk tales. And for one Florida explorer, the legend of the dinosaur lives on, not in the picture books, but deep in the swamps of the African jungle. Dave Willingham has the story. These are not real dinosaurs. Everyone knows dinosaurs became extinct millions of years ago. But there are people who believe dinosaurs still live. Fairly rational people. And they don't seem to care much that they get a lot of funny looks. Jim Culberson of Melbourne, Florida is one of those. I really am not worried about what people think. Mm -hmm. Because at this point in time, I'm convinced the varmint's in there. Jim wasn't too hard to convince, being a globe-trotting adventurer type anyway. Reading about the legend of the living dinosaurs got the better of him. He wound up on a $20,000 expedition to the People's Republic of the Congo in Africa earlier this year. Jim's group slogged for three weeks through nasty swamps along the Likawala River in the Congo, where the dinos are reported to hang out. They're in an area untouched by changes in climate and geology for a hundred million years. Jim's a photographer. He took lots of slides. Jim says he heard eyewitness accounts from natives that convinced him even more strongly that modern-day dinos do exist. He claims there are five species, but the main interest is over Mokeli Mbembe, which reportedly is about 40 feet long and looks like this fellow, the Apatosaurus, previously known as the Brontosaurus. Like a half dozen expeditions before, Jim's group of five Americans came up empty. Mokeli Mbembe was nowhere to be found. But Jim remains undeterred. Is, is, is this become a, an obsession with you? Well, uh, at this point in my life, it is my main objective. Jim says he will return to chase the legend of the lost dinosaurs, which goes back to reports from French missionaries 200 years ago. But it's just been in the last 15 years or so that fearless explorers have gone in search of the dinosaurs. Their exploits, by the way, supposedly inspired the Indiana Jones movie character. I love jungles and I love swamps and the bugs don't bother me and the heat doesn't bother me. Uh, Mainline scientists think the dinosaur hunters don't have all their oars in the water. But maybe they can't feel the lure of legend and mystery, of probably mythical creatures like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot. Surely that's what drives Culberson. No, not really that so much as my desire to research the unknown. And uh, of course I'd love to be the first person to take a picture of a living dinosaur. I conducted my own expeditions to the Congo in 1986 and 1992, but also found that gathering information about Mokeli and Bembi was very difficult due to the belief by the Congolese that if anyone openly speaks of the animal to outsiders, then great tragedy will come upon them. We were assisted for a time by a great elephant hunter called Emmanuel Emongamila. He eventually fell ill with dysentery and malaria and was hospitalized in the capital city of Brazzaville for over a year. The pygmies believe that he was ill because he helped outsiders in their search for Mokeli and Bembi. Here is the leg bone of a large animal that was killed in the unexplored Bayi River in the northern Congo in 1992. The local people would not let me keep the bone, no matter how much money I offered them. I had to be content with this single photograph before leaving this potential piece of evidence behind. Perhaps the most prolific explorer of modern times concerning Mokeli and Bembi is Frenchman Michel Ballot. Married to a Cameroonian national with family ties to the country, Michel has been exploring the Bumba and Jar rivers almost annually since 2008. His persistence has paid off with new information from eyewitnesses that have led him to discover these astonishing footprints from three different large animals 
in a remote area of the Jar River, where even the most adventurous native hunters will simply not go. Not only were French zoologists unable to identify these footprints, but these large three-toed footprints are remarkably similar, if not identical, to the frying pan-sized three-toed footprints found by the Jesuit missionaries in the Congo forest in the 1700s and by Trader Horn in Gabon in the late 19th century. We wish Michel good fortune in his quest and perhaps I shall join him in the near future. The Congo Basin covers a vast area of 1.4 million square miles or if you like 3.7 million square kilometers. Here we see it from the air. As we can see, the forest canopy is virtually impenetrable. Much of the basin is made up of tropical rainforests, rivers and swamps, including countless small lakes dotted in the interior. In an area this vast, any number of prehistoric or new unknown species can survive virtually undetected for generations in an area that has not changed since the days of the dinosaurs. Exploring an area as vast as the Congo Basin in search of possible living dinosaurs or any new species is a very hit and miss affair. Even if a well-equipped expedition were able to penetrate a hundred miles or more into the gloomy, almost impenetrable interior, it is still like looking for a moving needle in a haystack. Today, ecotourism is a popular pursuit. So if you ever find yourself in the heart of Africa, photographing forest gorillas like these, then keep your eyes and ears open and your camera at the ready. For you never know when a Mokele Mbembe might decide to make a surprise appearance. <laughs>